Welcome to the Jaron Jarvis channel. I am Jaron Jarvis. Today, I would like to introduce to you, case file number 35 Mr. Ramsey. First, case file 1. Previous, case file 34. Next, more files tilde. Case file, 052 to 225. Case file date, the 6th of June 1996. Location, Utford, Arizona. In the summer of 1996 many children began to go missing in the town of Artford. Initially our people in the area attributed it to a serial killer or someone of a similar degraded mental state but through various accounts, video camera footage, and readings we've come to believe that a paranormal entity is behind most, if not all of these disappearances. All of the following will contain anything that has been deemed relevant to this case. The first child to gain attention was Amelia Waters. It is unsure if she was the first one to go missing or just the first to be reported and have her story picked up by the local media. Regardless, she is the beginning of this rabbit hole. At the time of her abduction we had no reason to have agents in the region actively on lookout so our only source of information comes from interactions that her mother, Tabitha Waters, had with the police. Police officer, Mrs. Waters, I know that you've told various other officers what you know, but I'm going to politely ask that you recall everything once more now that you've had time to fully process everything. I will be recording this so that we can scour this conversation for any clues that we can. Is that okay? Tabitha Waters, light sobbing yes. Yes, of course officer. P.O., did you notice anything different about your daughter over the last several months or so? Weird behavior, any off comments? Anything that might put us at the start of our trail? T.W., she was a good girl. She played with her friends, did her school work, and was just, good. Sobbing intensifies Amelia was looking forward to going on vacation as soon as school let out. And then, and then I went to wake her up one morning and her window had been smashed open. She was gone. P.O., I understand Mrs. Waters. I am once again sorry that you have to dredge up these awful feelings once more. T.W., sniffling no, no, I understand. I mentioned it to the other officer but she did make an imaginary friend recently. Something that I didn't think twice of. You know how kids are. P.O., of course. Mom, it's entirely possible that this imaginary friend was the person that abducted your daughter. Is there anything you can tell us about this friend? T.W., she was, oddly coy when talking about him, but I didn't think twice about it because she was the same way when she liked a boy in class. You know how girls get. I feel so awful for not getting more involved, for not seeing the signs. P.O., there is no way you could have known this was going to happen. From all accounts she appears to not have had any large tells that something was going on. I do think that this imaginary friend is the biggest lead we have. Is there anything else you can remember? T.W., I know it was a boy. She would call it him or he the few times I did get her to open up about her friend. I'm afraid that's all I know though. The conversation goes on for a while more but the above covers everything relevant to this case. Around the same time the police searched Amelia's room with the one oddity being a stack of drawings found under her bed. All of them being crude depictions of her and a Mr. Ramsey, presumed to be her imaginary friend. This Mr. Ramsey appeared to be a stuffed animal or toy of some sort due to how small he was drawn relative to the other human-like subjects. Unknown to the police is that Mr. Ramsey's appearance also screams out entity to those of us in the organization, elongated limbs, oddly placed behind trees, outside windows, and in other strange places in the drawings, and two black circles for eyes with no other notable features. To the average person these would certainly appear to just be some slightly creepy drawings. A few days later the next child goes missing. Adam McPherson's parents woke up to the front door wide open and Adam gone. Unlike last time, Adam's parents had been more alert after Amelia's disappearance and told the police that they often found him talking to no one in his room usually pointed towards the window or closet. This prompted them to put a lock on the window that unfortunately did little to protect Adam. 
Like last time the police found more drawings depicting Mr. Ramsey, same name and all. Like with Amelia the drawings depict Adam in various locales with Mr. Ramsey always being hidden somewhere in the picture, except for those of his bedroom where Mr. Ramsey is plainly in the room with Adam. Two pictures jumped out to us in particular though. The first is a crude drawing of Adam's parents sleeping with Mr. Ramsey's head under the bed. The second drawing is much more interesting though. Due to it being on top of the stack we believe it was the last of Adam's drawings. This one features no Mr. Ramsey, but it does show Adam walking down the street at night with a blonde girl with the same dark circles for eyes that Mr. Ramsey has been depicted with. One could argue that this is Amelia Waters who had blonde hair. At this point the town of Artford had a dark shadow cast over it. What was thought to be a girl that may have simply gone missing on her own had now became the start of a trend. Parents started to keep their kids indoors after school, locks were purchased, the most fearful parents put bars on their children's windows. This quaint conservative town was locked in a state of paranoia for fear of whoever was abducting children. Among all this fear the people of Artford were hardly surprised when Tabitha Waters was found dead in her home. Most imagined the woman took her life out of grief, and understandably so. A single mother lost her only child, her only remaining family, her fate most likely grim. Of course they would think she killed herself. We had agents actively working in Artford at this point though and we beat the police to the scene. Evidence was found to suggest that someone or something was keeping Tabitha from leaving her house and contacting anyone. This would have been mostly speculation if we hadn't recovered her scrawled ramblings found half eaten down her throat. The words written were heavily ruined due to saliva and the like but there were parts that were salvageable that give us an idea of what happened. Phone line cut, doors won't open, not my Amelia. That's not my little girl. Oh God, the singing, make it stop. Get that thing out of my daughter, done. She's, coming back, I've lost her. While not much to go on, it's enough for those who know there's more going on behind the scenes. The police and people of Artford assumed Tabitha Waters became a shut-in that killed herself out of grief, but we can see here that something was keeping her trapped at home and using the appearance of her daughter to torment her. What we can't concretely piece together is whether Tabitha killed herself to escape this torment or if the being tormenting her decided to finish the job. The end result is the same however and it hardly matters. Several days later Donald Jr. and Bethany Van are reported missing. The Vans happened to be a particularly wealthy family in town and quickly made a scene about the abductions. By this point we had operatives directly inserted into the investigation team to keep damage control to a minimum and figure out what exactly was going on. Luckily, evidence this time was much more concrete and able to paint a more clear picture. The first bit of evidence came in the usual form of children's drawings. However, it seems like the introduction of a sibling complicated what has now become a reoccurring abduction. If the drawings are stacked in chronological order like with how the other two sets of drawings are considered to be then it appears that our mysterious Mr. Ramsey may have been visiting the Van children before he ever appeared to Amelia Waters, or at least around the same time. Young Donald's drawings depict Mr. Ramsey similar to what Amelia had drawn, a strange elongated limbed, black circles for eyes, doll-like entity. His drawings show one major change that we think places it earlier than Amelia's however. The doll lacks legs and it appears to be dragging itself around in his drawings. This seems to be remedied at some point in time as Mr. Ramsey takes an interest in the neighbor's dog, drawn lying on the doghouse for several drawings. Then Mr. Ramsey reappears around the van house, this time with legs, and the doghouse is missing from all future drawings. A quick talk with the neighbors revealed that their dog disappeared two months ago, which they claimed shouldn't have happened due to the fenced-in yard. They assumed some delinquents must have taken the dog. Another oddity found in Donald's drawings are the fact that he is always depicted smiling while his sister Bethany has a frown. This leads us to believe that he was the one that Mr. Ramsey targeted or charmed in some way. It's probable that Bethany knew about Mr. Ramsey and was afraid of him. The final thing we can glean from these drawings is that there's a section of drawings where no Mr. Ramsey is present. He is nowhere to be found in any drawings until the last few, 
where a blonde hair girl with the dark eyes and another boy whose head appears to be on sideways. We assume this to mean that Mr. Ramsey approached the van children first, added the legs of the neighbor's dog, and then left to take Amelia Waters and Adam McPherson, before coming back for the siblings. While these drawings do help corroborate some ideas that have been gaining traction there is the other piece of evidence that the vans gave us, security camera footage. It seems that Mr. Van is more than a little paranoid when it comes to his safety and that security cameras are one of many measures he took to protect himself, his wealth, and this family. While the footage isn't exactly groundbreaking it does cement this incident as paranormal in nature. Of all the cameras Mr. Van had placed around the perimeter only one ever recorded paranormal incidents. This camera happens to be one placed on the garage beside the house. It's pointed at the front door and thus saw a lot of traffic. We began looking at footage from before Amelia Waters went missing to confirm that Mr. Ramsey appeared to the van children first. Our proof was in a peculiar visual effect. Normally paranormal entities distort footage and audio that they are caught on so this is nothing new to us. However, the form of distortion was decidedly odd in the case of Mr. Ramsey. We believe that wherever the doll appears a unique scratchy black distortion appears to cover it. One researcher observing the footage noted that, it almost looks like a child took a black marker and individually blotted out the entity in each frame. How quaint. The first instance of this distortion and therefore Mr. Ramsey's appearance take place in tapes marked several months before this string of children abductions. The blacked out spot suddenly appears at the foot of the front door one evening and lays there for several hours before Donald Jr. appears in a sleepy stupor, perhaps sleepwalking. He picks the doll slash distortion up before lazily returning inside. The next instance happens several weeks later, once again at night. This time Donald Jr. shambles up to a window beside the front door and stands there for hours without seemingly moving once. The boy is holding a doll-like silhouette for the entire duration of the child's staring session. Eventually he leans his head down as if listening to the doll and walks away from the window. Over the time leading up to the child abductions Mr. Ramsey's unique distortion is picked up every so often when young Donald walks by a window. Unfortunately we couldn't see any footage that showed the incident with the neighbor's dog nor Mr. Ramsey's exodus from the van residence but did manage to get pretty clear footage from the night the van children went missing. It was once again at night, a usual time for Mr. Ramsey's activities. By this point Mr. Ramsey had not appeared in Donald Jr.'s arms for quite some time due to being on its spree of abductions. An unexpected and yet not wholly surprising person walks up to the front door of the van house, Amelia Waters, the first victim. However, it is clear that she isn't the Amelia that went missing a short time ago. Her movements were stiff and odd, even someone not knowing a paranormal entity was involved would see this footage and be taken aback by the uncanny valley. She moved very much like an erratic clockwork soldier with an unsteady gait and limbs twitching at weird angles. A larger indication of what was going on could be seen when Amelia's face was on camera. Both her eyes and mouth had the strange marker-like distortion. The hypothesis is a grim one but we believe that Mr. Ramsey was wearing the skin or body of Amelia Waters like some sort of meat suit. What is currently unknown is whether this is a necessity for it to exist, just a means to conceal itself, or something it does out of a distorted sense of enjoyment. Shortly after entering the house a trio emerges from the front door. Amelia and Donald Jr. are dragging a limp Bethany out of the house and further out of view. The vans would later wake up to find their children missing but we would have agents on the scene to recover this footage before anyone else had time to catch wind of what was going on. The vans have a surprising amount of clout in Utford and have made the investigation a bit more difficult on our end since their involvement. Notably they've hired a private investigator to look into things on their side and it appears they're at least wary of some of our plants in the investigation. Regardless, we believe that as long as the investigation proceeds at a careful pace we should be able to proceed relatively normally. The next tragedy in the town befell the parents of a missing child, namely the McPhersons. They were found dead in their bed. The only reason they were discovered so soon is because family were still going over to see them regularly and console them. The McPhersons appear to have been strangled to death. 
Something to note is that blood not belonging to either victim was found both under the bed and slightly smeared on the victim's necks. On a hunch we checked the blood with samples we had from Tabitha and confirmed that this was most likely Amelia's blood, or rather Mr. Ramsey's now. The latest incident in this investigation happens to be the most gruesome. Perhaps the parents thought the rash of abductions wouldn't touch their children if it was held at a large event during broad daylight. They were very much wrong. The birthday incident was captured on tape by the father of the birthday boy, one Sean Webb. His son Connor Webb had just turned nine and they invited his class over for the standard birthday, most likely to distract the kids from the fact that four of their grade mates had gone missing. The party was a standard outdoors event, inflatable attractions, games, and a clown set in a decent-sized front yard. The party proceeds as normal for a while although there were little occurrences that would tip one off right away. A pair of children can be overheard talking about the two weird children that haven't been talking to the other kids. Another crying child can be heard complaining about a scary girl in the bounce house. The parents laugh it off or pay it no mind, probably in an effort to not think about the tragedy Outford was facing. Later one of the parents complains about a smell emanating from around the ball pit and Sean checks it out, also commenting on how rank the area was. After sifting through the balls he comes across what appears to be a chunk of rotted meat. Sean calls his wife and brother over and they talk about it for a moment. Sean's wife decides that a kid must have left food from the last party in the ball pit and the entertainment group that they rented the equipment from must have cleaned it poorly. They agree to shut down the ball pit for fear of germs. The party continues normally until Sean realizes that he hasn't seen Connor in a few minutes. You can hear him muttering a bit and the camera falls down to his waist as he looks around. Eventually he sighs a breath of relief and repositions the camera to show Connor on the far side of the yard underneath a tree and talking to two rather well-dressed children who don't appear properly on camera due to a fuzzy haze. Sean says aloud that he doesn't recognize the kids from Connor's class and begins to walk towards him. He's interrupted by the party clown walking in front of him with a large stack of balloons obfuscating his view of Connor. When the clown passes the two kids are gone and Connor is walking back towards the party who was that buddy. What are you talking about dad? I saw you talking to those two kids over by the tree. I don't remember seeing them from your class. I. The conversation is quickly cut short as Mrs. Webb calls Connor over for presents. Sean looks back towards the tree once more before walking over to the gathering children and parents. The present opening goes without incident until Mrs. Webb unveils a rather large, unwrapped cardboard box. She struggles to pull it over to Connor who looks at it with wide eyes. Sean asks her who sent the present but it's unmarked. None of the other adults or children chime in so Connor gets the go-ahead to open it up. The young boy tears the box open to reveal a slumped puppet. He fiddles with it a bit more and the head suddenly cranks to the left with a sickening thud while showing the identity of the puppet to everyone crowded around. Screams can be heard as everyone realizes that Connor is propping the corpse of Adam McPherson up. Connor drops the body and runs into the house as parents try to push their children back away from the corpse. Sean runs into the house after his child but can't seem to find him. He looks around, calling his name for a while before he seems to notice that the back door is wide open. Sean sprints out to the backyard to see that his son isn't there. The camera is wildly shaking back and forth as Sean screams for his son. A sudden scream from the far side of the bushes kicks the father into action but for his haste he is only met with a gruesome sight. Connor lay kicking and rolling around on the ground in a pool of his own bloody. Closer inspection shows that the child is missing the majority of his left arm. Standing in front of him and fiddling with the newly severed arm is Mr. Ramsey in the rather decayed corpse of Amelia Waters. Patches of skin had fallen off completely so that more and more of the humanoid figure was covered up by the scratchy distortion. Mr. Ramsey appeared to be pulling back the meat and skin in an effort to work the bone of the arm. It's likely that Connor was meant to be the next meat suit. Stopping only for a moment Sean quickly grabbed his son and ran off towards the front yard only to be met with another strange sight. The parents were all attempting to snap all the children out of some sort of slump. 
Sean's arrival may have agitated something though because as soon as he called to his wife for help the puppet of Adam McPherson suddenly sprung to life and latched onto her. As if on cue the other children all snapped back to life and began to assail their family as well. All except for the injured Connor who lay cradled by his dad on the front porch. Amidst the carnage of the adults being torn to shreds by their offspring a pair of children can be seen calmly walking up to the porch. Without the distortion on them the pair can easily be identified as the van children. Donald Jr. picks up the discarded camera and points it towards Sean who is still cradling his son and sobbing deeply. In the background Mr. Ramsey can be seen entering the house from the back door with a fresh arm. The entity shakily walks up to the bear, singing an odd and distorted tune in an unknown language before the camera suddenly shuts off. Everyone who attended Connor's birthday party is now missing. The only thing found at the Webb's residence was a wrecked party and lots of blood. No body parts or evidence was found except for Sean's video camera neatly placed on the front porch. Interviews with the neighbors that didn't attend the party weren't fruitful as none of them saw or heard anything. As far as anyone can recall they suddenly looked out at the Webb's house to see it in the state it's in now. It is entirely unclear how Artford will deal with the more sizable group of people being taken. Further updates will be given as events unfold. Update, the 28th of February 2000 something is very wrong. I happen to be an investigator different from the one that covered this incident but there is no record of this file in our database. Had I not looked through the physical records of everything we had on Artford I would never have known what happened to the town. Artford is now gone as I've already written up in the events of Philo 29-482. I had no idea the community had experienced something prior to what happened in my file but it seems this Mr. Ramsey isn't even the first tragedy in Artford. Why have none of these files been properly recorded? Also troubling is how they have no conclusion. What are the organization heads thinking? Update the 3rd of June 2000 I've talked to what little remains of the staff that would have been in art for during this time. None of these operatives remember Mr. Ramsey or this incident. I've gotten similar responses from the even few people that should have responded to older incidents in the town. What was happening in Artford? I plan to keep digging into this because I now fear for what will happen to me. I was very involved in the most recent Artford incident. Am I in danger? Case file, reopened. Oh, what a mysterious file, what mysterious implications. Was someone trying to hide all the ill tidings in Artford? Was this instead the work of an enemy entity? I'm just dying to know. On a different subject, I apologize for my departure. It seems the toll of nursing secrets back to health and my own personal quest have gotten in the way of your entertainment. Apologies. Secrets is doing much better nowadays. He's less vegetable and more amnesiac. I've sent him back to his hometown to recover under the pretense that he was in an awful car accident that resulted in him being in a brief coma before he suddenly came to. He and all of his family believe this to be the case. With any luck he'll remember all of you here eventually but I wouldn't hold my breath. Now go along and enjoy your file, lest Mr. Ramsey pay you a visit. Tattle.